make our life into something exciting? That's what we'll talk about today. If I had any dignity, that would have been humiliating. Adam Savage. If you don't know who Adam Savage is, and if you never had a chance to watch the Mythbusters show, I highly recommend going back and finding them. They stand the test of time because they do such interesting things. The show is made up from Adam Savage and Jamie Heineman. And then there were three other people, Carrie Bryan, Grant Imahara, who worked on the Star Wars movies with special effects with miniatures. Unfortunately, he passed away. And Tori Bellici. Just a, such a great show. I loved it more than anything because they just tried experiments. Like, could they make a car that was more fuel efficient by making it have the puck marks of a golf ball? Since golf balls are built to be aerodynamic. I mean, just really interesting things. So I love this show. And Adam Savage wrote this book, Every Tool's a Hammer, Life is What You Make It. I've always wanted to read this book. I saw that he had it and I bought it a while ago. And so now I have this opportunity to do a podcast about it. And I was not disappointed. I dreamed as a kid, this is going to be the dumbest story I'll tell you all day, is that I wanted to be a set designer in Hollywood. That was actually, next to being an astronaut, my dream job. I thought you would read about like what it looks like to be in a medieval castle, and then you'll research it, and then you'll get out your hammer and your sewing machine, and you'll build a medieval castle. I just loved the thought of that. My favorite idea. But you know what? I never followed through on things. I never went to the umpteenth degree to learn how to do any of those things. And in fact, we'll talk a little bit more about some realizations I came to about how you can make your dreams come true, even if you don't become a myth buster. <laughs> he admits that he grew up, he was in those maker fairs. And there's a website, used to be a magazine called Maker, where he would build things. It would show you how to build catapults, and it would show you how to build computer cards and, and all sorts of things. And I never really felt qualified to do it. But the one thing that was good on my part is I had a dad who was great at those. He was an aircraft mechanic. But here was the other part of it. He was a math genius and very into science. And he was a poor guy. He didn't have any money. And he got a full scholarship to Texas A&M. And then the Vietnam War happened and it just never came about that he went there. And so he taught me a lot of things about math and science and how to build things. And so I had this opportunity of sort of being a poor tinkerer. I didn't have a lot of stuff, but I could build some things. I remember I built a catapult trebuchet thing that would launch a guy, a little fake guy, with a parachute. It was my favorite project I ever did. Adam had a same kind of experience, but he tried to do everything. And he realized he's a maker. He's a tinkerer. This is what really excites him. And so this book is a little bit about that, but it's written in such a great way to help you generalize the whole thing. So it's about you and what you could do. Because he says right away at the beginning of the book, people will say, I'm a computer programmer. I'm not a creator or I'm a this. I'm not a creator. I'm not a maker. And he said, that's ridiculous. Cook coder, crafter, whatever it is, whatever it is you do, you are. That's exactly what you are. You are a maker, regardless of what you do. He told someone, everything we do is putting ourselves out there and using our brain. It's not about living in the culture or living with the things we have. When we put our soul and our voice and our effort into making something, it not just builds the thing. It builds the culture. It builds, he, he thinks, like what we could all be. It makes us creators. And I think that that is amazing. I think it's an amazing way to look at it. And he admitted he didn't know really how to write this book. He never wrote a book before. But again, that idea of living life as a creator said, you know what? I'm going to do it the same way. I build everything else. I'm going to build this book like that. So he breaks this part down. We're going to do this book in a couple of segments here to talk about what his plan is. And he said, you know what? There's no path. There's no A to B or A to Z. Sometimes it is wild and unpredictable. And 
that's the whole part about being a maker, about being someone who creates something. And that's what I really walked away from this book is whatever it is you're doing, whether you're building a rocket, whether you're building a podcast, where you're building a book, or you're creating a song that you wrote on your guitar, or you're writing up a website that will help people do something, you are a maker. And so he said that that's what this book is about, helping you get started and get over the inertia, the indecision, all the things that drag you down and start making. And I thought that inspired me right then and there in this first chapter of the book. So he said the first part of it is, is that obsession is what gets you moving, is what keeps you stuck to the project. It is a destructive force, he says, or it can be passion. It could be the passion to create something and finish something. And that when you match that passion with what he calls emotional self-awareness so that you have that maturity in order to do the things that you want to do, it's unstoppable. And he, like I, was obsessed with Star Wars as a kid. I was totally obsessed with it. And he said he wasn't sure how he could tell people how much this show meant to him that wouldn't get him stuffed inside of a locker. I'll tell you the route I took. I never told my friends. I was a nerd through and through, and I never said a word to them about any of it. I never talked about Star Wars. I never talked about Star Trek. It was something I talked with my dad about, but never my friends until I went to college and I met my people. But he says that if we follow through on, he says, what thrills us when we all of a sudden see that peak in our heart kind of go pitter pat, and something that catches our eye or something that makes us obsessed or makes us want to stay up late and keep working on it, then we found the creative thing we're good at doing and the thing that's going to lead us to a bigger path. So he says, catch yourself in those moments. Pay attention to when something really grabs you. And then you'll start understanding yourself better. And he just believes that you jump into things with both feet. Details are important. Going to school is important. Doing the things that you're supposed to do is an important part of life too. But don't just dismiss things as hobbies or passions. They are the things that give us purpose and the thing that if we put our energy in them and find a place where it can serve us, and I think too, serve other people, boy, it's going to make our lives so much better. And so he challenges us to look at how your brain works. What is the way that your brain lights up? What is the way that you get things done? How you like to go through things? He says, you know, it could be everything from screenplays to cooking to working on a marriage. But those are the things that are going to make you have that sense of purpose. And he says, when he found his, quote, it felt like my superpower. He talks about how when he was 16, he built the suit from Excalibur. It's a lot of work, but he diagrammed the whole thing out so that he would know how to build it. And it's exciting. I saw it. It is really amazing uh, what he did with that. But he says that those types of things are going to inspire us. He also says that we shouldn't just throw ourselves into alienation, lock ourselves in a closet and be alone. He says, quote, I don't believe the river of ideas runs where loneliness lives. Isolation is desolation. It is barrenness. So I think it means we have to get out there too and bring other people into our vision and our work and find our people so that we can do these things together. I think that's what's so great about the internet right now. I mean, if you are interested in making Excalibur armor, you will find a Reddit group or some kind of group out there that'll be people who want to do the same thing you want to do. That's the amazing thing. I'm going to high school. I can't find a single person of my friend group who likes Star Wars and Star Trek. But now, everywhere. So that's exciting. Which means giving over to your obsession, going in and doing everything to that finite detail. The idea of building something, of deconstructing it, of understanding how it works is going to be amazing to you. I think a little bit, and I'm not sure if it's true today, that when you saw kids a parent would say, well, maybe you should take a break. Maybe you should try something else or try something new. And parents got worried about obsessions. But I think what he's saying here is if 
the obsession is over something good and positive and makes you into a creator, run with it and do that. He considers that people who clip the wings of people who are obsessed with something is a sin. It's counterproductive that we should be encouraging people to follow their inspirations and the things that really excite them. And then it comes down to lists. Now, he says that a lot of times creative people think, I don't believe in lists. I'm a creative person. But he'll explain a little bit about why the lists are so important. It is important to have a detailed list of the things you need to buy. If you're building an Excalibur armor set or a Star Wars model, or you're learning how to play music, you need to know what you have to own. Lists. You have to know what you need to practice, what you need to get good at. And so those lists, he said, are so important. And that if we get good at lists, it will allow us to do big projects, little projects. We'll get them all done. And these lists are something that will start from beginning to end and get us through the completion. See, this is where I thought I had a problem and, I was, and why I think I didn't end up a kind of maker when I was a kid. Because I never completed things. I'm a very easy, laid back person. And now I've learned the importance of completing things when I don't think I understood it as a kid. I made a UFO outfit for Halloween one year. And because my dad, again, was a mechanic of airplanes, he had all this bits and pieces and wires and things that he could get me. And he got me this battery pack and I wired it up and he showed me the basics of wiring. And I was into this. I, basically walked around in this saucer dome and it lit up with lights that were on the outside and on the inside of this dome. My head was in the dome. And at one point, eh, I got tired of it. There were things I could have done to make this better. I wish I would have pursued it more. But at some point I thought, "Eh, this is good enough, right? Let's just stop here. And what he's saying is, if we have a list, we'll be able to complete things. And now I'm better at that. And I'm better at understanding why that is. So that when I create a tip sheet, I go to the end degree. Right now, I'm working on a Bible study podcast that I'm going to roll out in January. So I started working on this format for every episode of the podcast of what things we're going to cover. And I thought, well, I really need to have descriptions of each of the things I'm going to talk about. Oh, this is good enough. Just a little word here or there. No, Jill, this needs to be complete. This needs to be something that people can take and use on their own. And if you don't give them a good explanation of what it is you intend, it's not going to work. So now my brain works a little bit better at discovering how to be more complete and go to the proper level of detail that I didn't have as a kid. And I think because I didn't have it as a kid, I think I never ended up being that tinkerer, the person who was going to be a set designer, because I would sew something for myself, like a uniform or an outfit or something. And then I'd be like, oh, that's good enough. Now I understand the steps I needed to take when I was a kid in order to get to be what it was I thought I dreamed of being. So he says that the first thing he does is he creates a list of all the items. When he completes an item, he colors it in fully. When he's halfway through the task, he halfway fills in the box and the box is empty. It means he hasn't even started it. That's the first thing. So getting good at the list. And he says that when you have a list, it's going to give you momentum. And the idea is, is that you don't get momentum until you start filling out the list, until you start checking things off the box. And once you start seeing your progress, you're going to build momentum. Those are the things that are going to carry you through. There's a lot of people that are disparaging now of the whole concept of willpower. You'll lose weight when you have willpower. You'll build your Excalibur uniform or your Star Trek uniform when you have momentum. But instead, now people believe it's the other way around. By building things and checking things off the list, you will get enthusiasm, momentum, excitement about your project just as you go through and start creating things that are in your list. So he says his step process of creating a list has to do with, first, he makes a brain dump of everything, every idea that he thinks about that you need to do, everything he needs to buy, everything he needs to go, and he just dumps it all out on a piece of paper. Then he organizes it into bigger chunks. So if I'm going to build a Star Trek uniform, I need to get materials. This is the shopping list. Then I need to work on the basic uniform. Then I have to work on the adornments, you know, the 
cuffs and the collars, you know. And so you go through that list and you then put it through those bigger chunks. Then he gets to the small steps, which he calls the medium chunks. And so that's going to be more details in each of the different items. So he starts flushing that out. And then he says, step four is dive in and start working on it. And once you start finding that you build part of it, you might see what it is now you need to do. Maybe your list is going to change a little bit as you gain experience doing what you're trying to do. And sometimes you're just going to find it's going to take longer than you expected. And sometimes you're going to find tough problems you're going to have to solve. So just be ready for the fact that your list may not go exactly as you expected. And then once you start finding out that the list is not going as you expected, make more lists, he said. That's where you're going to add things in. You maybe subtract things you didn't need and you keep going with that list. He says that he makes lists for every day, for every project, and so that he knows how to go through them. I use technology now for list making, primarily the app Todoist. It keeps me on track with all the things I'm trying to work on. A lot of people love the paper, but I love applications for this. And then he says step six is to put away for a while. You know, give yourself some breathing room. We talked about this in countless podcasts where sometimes you just need to get away from it, do something else, go for a walk. And then when you come back to it, you're going to have fresh ideas. But also you're not going to get to that point of frustration. I think that's what got me when I was a kid is I would get to this part and it was frustrating and I couldn't figure a way out. And instead of walking away for a little bit and giving it some breathing room, I would just keep persisting until I was utterly frustrated with the whole thing. And then I would just say, oh, it's good enough. He's saying if you walk away and give it a little time, you'll be able to come back to it with new energy. And he says oftentimes he has to remember to himself, slow down. Don't force yourself into a rut. You know, I've worked on countless projects where I just stayed up until it was done and I was exhausted. And, and then in my brain, it, it was a bad experience. I was frustrated. And so by slowing down, Stepping away a little bit, giving it some breathing room, you're going to do a lot better. He talks about an interesting concept, you know, about getting things exactly right. And he said that that's been kind of the challenge of his whole life, addressing the fine details, being exactly accurate all the time. And he said that was because he has this great desire to finish. And that sometimes means that he will do so in a way that causes sloppiness or causes something not to work out quite the way, you know, that you wanted it to. And, and I think that's my struggle too. I just want to finish things. I am so driven to finish things that sometimes they can be bad. He says that he has a friend named Tom Sachs, who is a artist in New York. And he created this list of Tom Sachs 10 bullet points. And so he talks about work within the system, create a sacred space, be on time, be thorough, I understand, which means you give and get feedback. Sent does not mean received. So if you're sending something off to someone, make sure that the person on the other side got it. Keep a list. There we go with the list part. And then he says this interesting thing. Always be knolling. No one knows what in the world knolling is. And it turns out what he would do is when he would create art, he would go around his art studio and line up every device every cutting machine, every dowel perfectly. His first step in any project he did was to just set it out so everything was exactly right. And that's what he called knolling. I'm not really sure why knolling. I guess it's a furniture design thing. But he said that at that point, it made every step, every aspect of his job better because everything was ready to go. And that stuck with Adam too. He thought that is a way that he can start on his projects and cut in the right place by setting it up correctly. Do the diligence he needs to to make something right instead of getting something done. And he says, too, that you don't have to look at it necessarily in a tinkerer or an artist way. Create a workspace that is usable for you. Does it have the right coffee cups? Does it have the right pens? Is it the right lighting? Get rid of the things that don't add to your experience. And then group them to like, you know, have a cup of pencils, have all your pens over there and all your paints over in this other location. Get everything set up just exactly right. And then when you're doing measurements or anything like that, all the measurement items are together. 
And he likens this to the cooking concept before where it's everything in place, which is a French term, which I'm not going to say because I'll just mess it up. But it means everything's ready. So if you were going to create this fantastic meal, you would chop your onions, you would chop this up, you would have everything waiting in bowls, exactly ready to go. So that when it came time to do the next activity, everything's ready and set to go. I love making ice cream and I make this one ice cream, which is basically salt and caramel. And you have to heat up sugar to the temperature of the sun and it will melt and burn everything off of everything unless you do it correctly. And everything goes quite quickly when you're making the candy for it. And I would just like, quick, run over here and get the butter. Quick, run over here and get this. And I would just run around trying to get everything done because everything had to be done within a half a second. And all of a sudden, I'm like, what about the cooking show where they just set everything out and everything's ready to go? Now I do that. And that's what this knolling practice is, is just to make sure that everything is ready to go. And then he says in the end, don't try to be the hero. Quote, trying to be the hero is a terrific way to end up being the villain. Meaning if you're going to do everything by yourself and you're not going to ask for help and you think you're going to solve all the problems and do all the things and pull whatever project it is out of the frying pan that you're looking to do, it could end up being a disaster and you could be the villain of the story because you just never asked for help. So I think that's valuable. I'm not a very good asker of help either. So again, this book spoke to me quite a bit. And I think the thing that I thought was interesting, you know, in this book and looking at it in general, I never became a tinkerer. You know what? I became a talker. At some point, I learned I loved public speaking. When I gave presentations at conferences and even in doing the podcast and everything, else, I love it. Someone on a podcast last week I was listening to said that she had a blog for a decade and she said, I'm not really a very good writer. I don't enjoy writing. And then all of a sudden podcasting came out and she goes, wait, I can say these words. I don't have to write them. And then she just learned to love podcasting. And so when I was reading this book, it made me a little sad because I did want to become a maker or a tinkerer or something like that person who builds things. You know what? I am building something. And instead, I'm using a different skill I love doing. I love learning how to say things better. And I love learning how to be a podcaster better and a public speaker. It's just my favorite thing. And so while this book is talking about making things, to me, I fulfilled this by growing my skills in communications, in public speaking. So it gave me hope that I'm on the right path. All right. So my challenge to you is see if you could create small lists. Can you go through the process of first finding a small project, doing a complete brain dump on every step you need to take, then big chunks, then breaking them up into smaller chunks, and then start working on your list and going through it. See if it helps you Follow every detail, dot every I, and make sure that whatever you're working on comes out great. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Remember, I have another podcast, which is Small Stuff with God, which is a lot like this podcast, but we talk about religious topics. S still the same flow, where sometimes I talk about a book I'm reading, and other times I talk about a topic that's not from a book. But we talk about those topics of living, walking in the faith with small steps. So... If you like this podcast, you might like that one too. You can find that podcast at smallstepswithgod.com. And remember, our path to being creative in the best possible way starts with small steps or maybe medium chunks. <laughs>